Dr. Miller, whenever you'd like to begin. You ready? Yes. Good evening and welcome to the January 19, 2021 FY 2022 budget work session. For those of you I have not met, my name is Dr. Winnie mm -hmm. Miller and I'm serving as the board chair at this time. Before we begin, I would like to ask everyone to turn off any wireless communication devices to avoid any interference with our meeting. Thank you. Uh, the Board of Education has convened this meeting for the sole purpose of discussing the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. This work session is the first of two budget work sessions and two public hearings that the board is conducting to develop its budget submission for consideration by the county executive. The purpose of these budget work sessions is to fine tune the budget proposal sent to us by CEO, Dr. Monica Golson, so that it meets all of our highest priorities and represents the best spending plan that will serve all of our students and staff across the county. Our work sessions will be recorded and will be on our board web page. So let's get started. Ms. Berkeley, would you please call the roll? Ms. Berkeley? Yes, yes, Dr. Miller. Was that you playing the music, trying to get everybody pumped up for this session? Not at all. <laughs> Good evening, board members and administration. Happy New Year. All righty. Mrs. Adam Stafford. Here. Mrs. Ahmed. Here. Ms. Boozer Struther. Here. Mr. Burroughs. Here. Mr. Harris. I see that he's raised his hand. Maybe he's having issues with his uh, audio. Yeah, I think, in, I think he's in the participants one, but I just gave him the right link. So he should Okay, but I want to acknowledge that he did raise his hand. Ms. Jackson. Present. Mr. Montero. Here. Mr. Murray. Here. Mrs. Queen. Mrs. Shepard? Here. Mr. Thomas? Here. Mr. Valentine? Here. Mrs. Williams? Present. And Dr. Miller? Present. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will now move to a portion of the agenda designated for budget discussion. Before we get started, Dr. Golson, do you have any general opening remarks uh, that you'd like to provide before we begin our discussion of the various sections of the proposed budget? No, I do not. I um, just wanted, to, but one quick update that this is um, conversation and discussion around budget for fiscal year 2022, which is for the school year 2021 to through 2022. And we'll begin with operations and supporting services. Okay. Uh, thank you for that update. Um, before we proceed, I'd like to remind my colleagues that during this first round of questions and responses, you will have five minutes. Then you will receive three minutes for the second round. Staff will capture any questions that are not answered tonight, and those answers will be provided to all board members. So we'll start with uh, operations and support, support services. Uh, let's turn our attention to our first section, operations and supporting services. Mr. Stanton, our chief operating officer, would you please provide your pre presentation? Actually, um, board chair Miller, we actually don't do presentations. We allow our staff, board staff to begin their questions and then we respond to those since we only have 30 minutes for this um, division. Well, uh, are there any questions? Ms. Queen submitted some questions. Um, but does any of the other board members have any questions at this time? 
for the staff before any presentations are given. Yes, Dr. Miller. This is Board Member Ahmed. Ms. Ahmed. Thank you. Um, Dr. Goldson, I appreciate the work that you and your team has put, have put into this budget. Um, I don't have a lot of questions uh, today about uh, specific numbers, and that's because we've had to be very uh, mindful and strategic about spending this year and, and um, this coming cycle that we're going into. So I have two questions today around operations, and they're both regarding the expected outcomes for two different departments. So my first question is around an expected outcome for the capital programs department. Uh, under expected outcomes for that department, it says by June 30th, 2021, increase the amount of annual spending of the approved CIP budget from 65% to 67% to provide evidence that projects are starting timely and moving towards completion. Uh, my question there is, why is that not 100%? So these are due by June 30th, and if, June 30th. And if you recall, CIP is on a different budget cycle than a regular school cycle. Um, so many of our summer projects might start, but they don't conclude until the conclusion of the summer. So if you recall, they're on a different cycle. All right. So conclude at the end of the school system's fiscal year, not the CIP fiscal year. All right. Okay, thank you. And then my other question is around food and nutrition services. It says under food and nutrition services under expected outcomes by, Jan uh, by June 30th, 2021, conduct two comprehensive sur surveys amongst high school students. I was just wondering what was what would that uh, survey look like and what does it mean? What are we gauging for? It's around food items that um, our students find that are tasty, that they enjoy, and those that they don't necessarily care for. Uh, so normally when we did those surveys, we used to do them um, where students could come and do a tasting. I think uh, several board members participated when we were in person. Um, so this would be more of a survey based on those students who've been able to pick up our free meals on Monday and Wednesdays um, and what they enjoyed and what they didn't so that we would not continue to offer it next year if they did not necessarily care for it. All right. Um, I, I certainly hope that the results of those surveys will be able to yield some positive results for students. Uh, in the coming year. So thank you for that. Uh, sure. I do want to add though, because students might get excited and think they can add Chick-fil-A. Um, these are items that still have to be meet the U.S. Um, Department of Agriculture's requirements around certain grains and proteins, et cetera, and are still low in sugar. So it's healthy eating, not necessarily what our students would like, which is a full bag of Cheetos. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Goldson. Um, Dr. Miller, those are my questions. Thank you, Ms. Ahmed. Are there any other questions relative to operations and support services? Ms. Queen. Hi, hello everybody. So I apologize for being late. Um, um, I do have a couple of questions and um, I guess this would go under almost every department when it comes to the school system, even operating support service. It's more about how the kids back fund has been spent to better Prince George's County public schools. Um, I think even during this budget season, we, I, we, I would like to have for us to have a breakdown of what has been spent and on what it has been spent on for the betterment of Prince George's County public schools. And that's in every department. Sure, we provided that information to the Board of Education in I believe a closed session. So we'll provide it again and so the public can see it as well. Thank you, I appreciate that one. And then the next one is, because I want everybody to know how it has been spent and what has been done, which is so very important. Um, what, what I did notice on the, um, a lot of our services and, and even on the operating and support services, I noticed that um, it's been an increase in some spending in some areas. And I, I was kind of like curious, what's the difference in the cost? Like what is the reason for the new cost of other contractor services? Um, for FY22, I noticed that was on, and I think that was on page 199 of Human Resources Operating and Staffing. Sorry, we get to the HR section at, six, at 620. So we have three more sections before we get to HR. So if okay. you don't mind holding that question and we'll come back to it when it's Dr. Murphy's chance to respond. Okay, no problem then. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions related to the operations and supporting services? 
If not, we'll allow Mr. Stanton to give his hand. Mr. Burroughs. Mr. Burroughs has his hand. Oh, Mr. Burroughs. Noah. Uh, uh, good evening, colleagues, and thank you, uh, Dr. Miller. Uh, Mr. Stanton, uh, thank you so much uh, for all the work that you've been doing. Uh, so great to work with you on so many issues. Uh, my question is, how much money was saved uh, and is being saved as a result of COVID in this division? When I look at transportation, we're not, I know we have a small bus program going on to feed students, but we're not running one of the largest bus, bus fleets in the nation at capacity. When I think about toilet paper and it's all, all of these things that we spend so much money on uh, with operations, you know, we're not doing that right now. So, I mean, is, is there a real cost savings or not really? And if so, what are we doing with that money and, and what is the plan around that? Yeah, I'll let Dr. Golson go first. Yeah, let, let me respond first. And yeah. you, I don't cover everything you can, Mr. Stanton. So it's, it's easy to look at it from, yeah, we might be saving in um, gasoline and around supplies, but unfortunately the funds that we are saving from there have to go to food and nutrition services. So if you recall, I shared with you that we've exhausted our funds for food and nutrition services to pay for our staff and we're now expending operating funds. So while we are granted to have the opportunity through USDA to give meals for free, when we were um, charging for meals that helped to offset our salary and the benefits for all those employees. So those employees are still working um, to help to prepare those meals. That fund has been expended. So we don't have money coming in and have not since March 13th for food and meals. Therefore, we have to use all of our savings to help pay. And I want to say that's around a $15 million gap, if I'm correct. Mr. Herbertson, just to say. Dr. Goldson, if I might uh, add to that a little bit. Um, you're, you're a little low, Mr. Herbertson. Oh, I apologize. Is there that better? Yep, it is. Uh, if I could add to uh, what Dr. Goldson said, uh, we are currently working on a financial review to come to the board because uh, this year's spending patterns are a lot different than uh, other years and how we had originally budgeted. There will be some areas that are up and some areas that are down. Uh, and those areas uh, where spending isn't quite uh, what it has been in previous years, like some of the ones that you mentioned, will go both to uh, that food and nutrition subsidy as uh, Dr. Goldson uh, said, and also towards overall district savings that uh, we're gonna use as part of the budget strategy to uh, prepay some items that would already be paid, uh, that would usually be paid for next year, and uh, thus use that to really close that FY22 gap. So that um, financial review will come to the uh, board in March. And at that point, uh, we'll really see the patterns of where we're able to uh, underspend uh, this year and those areas where uh, we're spending more than anticipated. And Dr. Golson, uh, I think it might be helpful to remind this, the board and the public that we also haven't laid off any employees and we're still paying people. So despite the fact that we're saving in gasoline, the majority of our money goes to personnel costs and those are maintained. Thank you for that reminder. Thank you. But that would go to them anyway. If, if I'm not clear. Well, so our would, food and nutrition fund is, a, is separate. So you can consider that as a separate revenue source. It's paid for through the cost of meals. So because we're not taking in any funds for meals and have not since March 13th, what money we had received prior to that is now all completely exhausted. And so now, even though those staff are still working to help prepare meals and distribute them, we're having to pay them out of our operating budget because we have not let those employees go. If we did, we wouldn't have anyone to prepare the meals for distribution. And so- just to follow up. So, so I recognize your hand first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so are we not uh, expecting or asking for like meal reimbursement from the federal government so that, you know, generally yeah. our free and reduced meal students, we, you know, you know, the federal government pays us. And so is it that we pretty much you know, in the future, we're expecting this lump sum from, from, from the federal government to cover this cost but right now we have to pay out of our operating budget or is the federal government not stepping up because of the person who has less than 24 hours left and all, all, I'm just trying to get a, a, 
Yeah. No Excellent idea. question. When we get reimbursed for the meal, it has never fully covered the cost of the employee. We only we don't get the full amount. And remember, our meals are subsidized, not just from free and reduced meals, and we get that amount back, but also those who are not free and reduced meal and pay the full price for meals. That is the money that we're losing. So we don't have any of that coming in. So we are getting the reimbursement, but we're not getting any of the funds that we would have gotten from the other 40% of our population that would pay the regular amount for meals. Did that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. That was a good question. Uh, I excuse me. Order point, Miss Queen, your hand was up. You have three minutes. Yes, thank you so very much, um, Dr. Miller. Um, so getting back to the question Mr. Bells had, um, I think, and then Dr. Miller brought up the same thing. I was thinking that employee salary, I understand, would have been played. And even normally when we kind of like subsidize with, subsidize with the money we make. But I'm just wondering, is not <clears throat> has not other money been saved from other things like we didn't have a big graduation so the money and i sent the email on on the cost that we saved from comcast and showplace arena on the money we still get on some of our energy savings so so many other places that we have actually as a school system really completely had to save on and i did request a breakdown of them things um you're probably just going to be getting that it still should have been ways for us to save to still to be able to get employee salaries done. And even through some of the grant funds and, the, and even the CARES Act and stuff like that, a lot of this, um, a lot of the supplies that was needed should have been done. And so that was one of the reasons why, another reason why I, I requested to see a complete breakdown, not just to name some of the things you did, but actually a complete breakdown on how spending was done on some of these items. Let me just give an example. A graduation is approximately about 500,000 and our gap for meals up to date was 15 million. Mm -hmm. So 500,000 closing a bigger gap of 15 million. So when you look at it, they equal up to hundreds of thousands, but not millions, not 15 million. That's why we did the hiring freeze to help to make sure that we could use some of that salary labs to help to pay for some of these um, gaps that existed. Okay, and 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 still ending within my three minutes. If I can remember, um, as actually doing PTA and even still now, we've always had a, a loss anyway from meals because sometimes kids didn't pay, and sometimes we got donations from organizations to kind of help us cover some of the meals. Um, so I don't know if that was needed that we inquired to have some of them donations done or whatever um, to help actually to help with some of the meals because I believe it was through the new budget that's coming out this year I know we put it in for kids to be feed be, be fed for free but I do understand the loss that we may have had last year because of COVID. Yes uh, so we we did add uh specific funds last year for that purpose um it, the the one of the issues we're having really is that our meal counts are down. So in regular years now, after we added those funds, we are at the point where the fund is self uh, sustaining. Mm -hmm. But uh, this year, with the meal counts down, it uh, is not. So that's really the primary cause of why we need the subs subsidy. Okay. Thank you so very much. Finally, is there are there any more questions in, in reference to support services and operations? Okay, we'll move to the next section, information talk technology. Uh, are there any board members that have questions of um, Dr. Zuckerman? Is Dr. Zuckerman here? I'm right here, Dr. Miller. Good yes. to see everybody. Okay. Um, Ms. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller, if, if um, if my if memory serves me right, this is Dr. Zuckerman's first uh, appearance before the board uh, for many years, and so I just wanted to ask, and knowing that this department is is probably uh, one of our uh, premier departments in terms of making sure that we are functioning and providing distance learning for students in the way that uh, we should. I just wanted to uh, ask and give Dr. Zuckerman an opportunity to kind of expand upon some of the goals for the department um, for the coming school year to make sure that we are, uh, for the rest of the school year, but also for the coming school year, uh, given the role, the magnificent role that uh, this department has played and will probably continue to play as we move forward um, and advancing even distance learning and online education overall. 
Um, thank you, Ms. Ahmed, and it is good to see everybody and, and be back in Prince George's County uh, again. Um, I thank you for the, the kudos to the IT division. They've done an incredible job before I got here, just a tremendous job to pivot on a dime very quickly to the emergency remote learning situation that we're in right now. Um, I, I think just going forward, I, this is truly a disruptive event in public education, obviously, but 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 from an education technology standpoint, I think there's a lot of interesting questions and challenges that we have ahead now that we um, have really reimagined our model for service delivery for our students. Um, as you probably know, up until March of 20, uh, up until March of, of 2020, we we had Chromebooks in our classrooms, in carts, in, in our media centers, and it was very much a what I would say would be an adult-centered model where uh, teachers would would take the devices, would check it out to students, students would give it back to the teachers if there was a maintenance issue, if there was a, a tech issue, everything was run through the adults in the building. Now we've pushed all of our devices out to our students, um, and that completely transforms the model. Uh, from service delivery. So we're spending this year, we'll spend uh, the rest of this year focused on um, all of the changes that accompany that service delivery model from our break fix and maintenance program to inventory management to student technology support um, to, uh, to training to, to infusing technology in the classroom. All of that is, um, is on our agenda going forward. So I would say that's one big area of work uh, another big area of work is bringing on a new learning management system to organize and coordinate all of the content and the education technology applications we have in a one-stop shop streamlined platform that our students and teachers can use. Um, and lastly, Dr. Golson has charged us um, as a team to consider what are our virtual learning opportunities gonna look like for our students after the pandemic is over. Once we get on the other side of this, um, God willing, very soon, uh, we'll be able to uh, just have incredible technology at our disposal for students uh, who want to continue um, in an online learning environment for the for the future, not as a result of COVID-19, but as a result of this, that is a option, an educational path that works best for them. So um, that's what we're doing in a nutshell. There are incredible team members in the IT division working on this every day, as you know, um, providing real-time support. And so while we do that through the day-to-day -day crisis, we also have to attend to the longer-term vision. So I'll pause there to see if there's any questions. Thank you for the opportunity to um, to represent our work. And I just couldn't be any you know, more proud than to be a part of the team again. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zuckerman. Um, Ms. Boozer-Struther. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Miller and uh, Dr. Goldson and uh, Mr. Herbson for your, and all the team for your work on, on this budget. Uh, once again, presented in a way that is uh, very clear for board members and the public to, to understand um, the expenditures and budget and goals. Um, I, just, I wanted to um, also give a, a shout out to the technology department and Dr. Zuckerman. And um, I had submitted a um, question through the uh, Q&A that board members get to do ahead of time. And I did just wanna call out to those who are watching uh, this, this uh, dialogue that that document is available with some uh, pretty extensive answers particularly around what Dr. Zuckerman just covered. And I just wanna thank, it, thank everyone in this department for the phenomenal job. The, um, when I first looked at the budget and saw a lower dollar number, that is what really jumped out to me about how this department has changed. And, and my, my expectation was that there were, you know, because of how many uh, parents, students and equipment now, you know, students and parents being needing service, customer service, and now the equipment that that would have been a larger dollar amount. And, you know, if there's uh, just, if you could expound a bit upon on that, I would appreciate it. Sure. And I think uh, you're referring to also the, just the purchasing of the actual hardware um, in particular, uh, correct? Correct. You know, all the, all the cost of maintenance repair, right. given the large number of, um, Chromebooks right. and iPads now in the system. Right. Um, so just from an inventory perspective, we, we purchased so much inventory in the last year, largely grant funded uh, to support the period we're in that we actually 
um, from a future purchasing standpoint, want to get on a cycle where we're, we're purchasing a certain amount each year, but we don't have to purchase as much next year because we, we did all that purchasing now. And so these our devices, our anticipated life cycle is about four years for the devices. So if we bought, for example, 65 or 70,000 devices um, in FY21, then we don't have to buy nearly as many next year uh, with the expectation that those are going to last four years. The, so that's, that's one reason that number is lower. Um, that being said, um, as uh, Dr. Golson and Mr. Herbson know, um, if there's additional CARES Act funding, I would be glad to uh, help the school district find ways to invest our technology in technology because we can continue to always invest. Maintenance is, and repair is an interesting question and one that we're grappling with right now. Um, we have warranties and there are different warranties for different devices. Uh, and so some of what we experience, whether it's a broken screen or, or keys that might be uh, popped off accidentally or, 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 um, or other uh, issues with devices can be covered under warranty. And, and we also have an in-house repair operation as well. So um, I'm analyzing that right now. We are uh, a little bit backlogged just in our repairs um, at the moment. And so I'm anticipating uh, spending more this year in repairs naturally because of the, the increase uh, in usage. But I don't know just yet, uh, Ms. Boozer Struthers, just how offset that will be based on the, the warranties that we have. And so that's why we're hedging right now just on that. And we'll have much more experience under our belt at the end of the school year um, to really zero in on what that repair program is going to look like in the long term. So um, that's, that's just where we are right now with it. In addition to Thank repair, uh, has the theft and loss costs been factored in there? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think there's going to be uh, every year some some loss that we can anticipate. Um, we are a, about, however, to go through an inventory reconciliation process where we'll have uh, just a much better handle of that. Part of the challenge here, just with assessing the inventory, is we had so many older devices at the start of the pandemic. So we introduced much more updated models, 2020 devices. Uh, and at the same time, we don't want to repair a device that's from 2012 or 2013. It's just not worth it at this point. So we have to go through that reconciliation process before I give you a complete definitive answer uh, to all of these questions. And we'll just be in a, like I said, just in a much better position several months down the road after we do that reconciliation. And what I would say, just one last thing is that, um, almost every school district is in the same situation, which is we, we had to pivot so quickly in March and we couldn't hold our equipment back. Um, and we wanted to get everything we had into the hands of our students and our families. Uh, and now is the time where we are uh, going through systematically to make sure that any repairs uh, that still need to be done on, on models that are under warranty, we're getting done. And uh, devices that we just need to take out of service, we do that. So, so we're, at, we're at the point where I think other districts are at right now too in the middle of the school year, which is to do this analysis. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zuckerman. Uh, Ms. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, first, I wanna um, congratulate Dr. Golson and the team on all of the work they did to pivot on a dime back in March. Uh, we had completed our uh, budget review and it was in the process of going through council and county executive and we were able to pivot and start this new year before we were expecting to be in the building in this new school year, but you were able to really pivot. And so I appreciate all the work that you and your team did in the IT department. Knowing that this budget is looking at the year starting July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022, I'm thinking about all of the um, equipment that's in the building with the expectation that we will be back in the school building in the fall. One of the challenges that I know schools in my district dealt with is keeping up to sp speed and current with technology that they use in the buildings, meaning cameras and microphones and all of those things that they use in the building um, that we're not using now. And so I wanted to give Dr. Zuckerman uh, an opportunity to talk about um, how this budget is going to help support the um, 
the modernization of in-building equipment. And also, I wanted to also hear about our ability to continue to um, give students, now that we're a one-to-one -one school system, to give students the ability to continue to learn and practice when they're outside of the school building. Yep, thank you for, uh, for that question. Um, so the budget for FY22, uh, it, part of our technology refresh budget each year to a certain extent goes to number one, our Chromebook and iPad program, number two, our server infrastructure, number three, um, our staff devices, and number four, other devices that you're speaking to, cameras, um, interactive panels. I anticipate that for next year, in combination with potentially additional federal dollars through um, subsequent uh, uh, CARES program dollars, that we'll be able to continue to accelerate on the types of devices that you're talking about because we're in a position now where we have achieved one-to-one -one for our Chromebooks. So that's my goal. It's not going to be, we're not gonna have, um, have everything. Um, it, it, technology is one of those things, especially if there's any techies on the board, you know that you can always have the next uh, latest device. And, and the unfortunate part about technology is as soon as you buy something pretty soon, uh, there's something else right behind it that renders what you just bought not obsolete, but not the it's 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 not the latest and greatest. So, um, what I'd like to do as a part of our inventory reconciliation program is define what the optimal uh, educational technology specifications are for a classroom, for uh, and then narrow that down to an individual student. So, to your point, at the student level, we want to make sure number one that every student has access to a device. Um, that's critically important. I think the second part of this, and I think it's going to be largely, I would imagine, a legislative priority uh, at the state level, is we need to ensure that students across Maryland have access to internet outside of school. I mean, that should just be, from my perspective, just a basic fundamental mm -hmm. utility right at this point. And that gets to that second part that you're speaking to. Um, we're doing a nice job right now um, addressing that in the short term with the crisis. But once we get back to in-person learning, we do want to create opportunities both in the school, uh, after school opportunities, whether they're, they're, they're lot through our library, um, cafe type experiences in schools. But at some point, the school buildings are going to close and students are going to go home for homework and we want them to be able to access the Internet. So I, I certainly see that on our legislative horizon. Thank you, Dr. Zuckerman. Uh, Ms. Shayla Adams Stafford. Unmute. I think I was after uh, Ms. Queen, or was that? Okay, all right. So I just wanted to echo the sentiments of my colleagues as well about our IT department. I told Dr. Goldson I was on a work call with someone in Arizona and they were singing the praises of PGCPS's IT department. And I had to tell her immediately that that is just awesome. So you guys did an amazing job with the rollout and getting those uh, computers out to our students. So I just wanted to congratulate you all as well. Um, I submitted a question, but that was kind of before I had a chance to really understand and, and see the budget in my, in my hand. So I had just a couple of follow-up questions uh, in regards to um, specifically uh, refurbished uh, laptops. If when students do returning computers or if computers you know have maintenance repair issues uh is it possible for us to uh sell those refurbished computers or do we receive any computers at discounted prices that are re refurbished um as we're uh looking at our asset uh management plan um and then also on page uh, 213 i just had a question about uh, who qualifies as other support staff because i noticed an increase between this year and uh, the following year. So th thank you again. Sure. So um, just with regards to the refurbish, we do, um, when our computers reach what we call end of life, where it just is, it's just not uh, financially makes sense to invest more into them, we do have a, we do sell them to a company that purchases them for parts. And I'd be happy to provide you just some more information about that. Um, so we do get that. We do get that back. Um, regarding just your question on, I'm just looking it up here on page 213. I, I can answer for you, Dr. 
Dr. Zuckerman. It's actually paraprofessionals. So Is that the paraprofessionals? I just hadn't looked at it. Thank you. We provided all of our paraprofessionals with laptops this year to make sure that they could assist with small group instruction in our special education classes. Yeah. They did not typically get a laptop before. And so we'll continue to offer that. Thank you, Dr. Golson. I'm sorry. So next year you're saying they will expand that so they'll also have uh, laptops as well. But they have them now. We gave them after we finished with students. But once again, those were to get us through now. Those older ones, as Dr. Zuckerman does an inventory that we've issued, those newer laptops that we gave to parents will go to those students and then students. we'll give them ones as well. So, yeah. so, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Queen. Again, thank you guys um, for the budget book. I really enjoyed this book, even though I didn't get it until Friday. Um, and I can't, I'm, I really needed to ask some of the questions. So you got some of my questions late Sunday night, and I know you got some today, and I have a whole lot more to send. But um, one of the ones I do want to highlight in on now, which one of the ones that I sent on Sunday, is on page 24, Dr. Zuckerman. Um, it talks about instructional technical support. I know this is a, wow. A big increase in FY 2021 over um, what was approved and what was estimated. And I understand that that was for dues and subscription. And I can understand that we had to buy a lot of subscriptions for, you know, Google and all these different programs. So I definitely understand why we have the big increase. But what I don't understand is why when we got into FY 2022, it was, it went back down. Right. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so the reason for that, we actually need to make uh, some adjustments to that, Ms. Queen. Um, we're running the analytics right now to determine based on uh, what our user usage rate is, um, what seems what would make the most sense to continue to purchase and how many licenses for each one. Um, you're right, it's not going to be $1,300 there, and it's going to have to be, we were counting, and I actually responded to this in Ms. Uh, Boozer, uh, uh, Struthers question that, um, around this specific issue, we anticipate leveraging, uh, continued leveraging federal dollars to be able to, to do this. And so it's in a restricted category in the budget. It'll probably continue to be in a restricted category in the future, uh, but we're gonna have to make some adjustments there for sure. And uh, Dr. Zuckerman, if I could add to that as well, um, really the fluctuations that you're seeing year over year are, uh, as uh, Dr. Zuckerman was talking about, really uh, a result of the CARES Act and when uh, those dollars were timed. So uh, there is, for example, a $15 million grant in the CARES Act specifically for technology purchases that drove up that number uh, that we had to spend before December. So that all of that money hits the 2021 budget uh, and then we won't have that available for 2022. And what Dr. Zuckerman is referring to is under the new federal award, the uh, Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations, we do expect that we will get additional uh, COVID-19 related funding. Uh, we haven't got our final allocations for that or uh, exact details on how that money will roll out. Uh, I, uh, I would expect that when we do complete that application, a significant portion of it will, uh, again, go towards technology. So it will be uh, likely increased in the final budget uh, within the restricted section. Okay, I think that was one of the reasons why I asked for the breakdown of how the CARES Act money was spent also. So the comparison could kind of like go with the budget and, and that's why I was asking for that. But if we go down, because I'll come back with questions on this again later. But if we go right down under that, where we have computer instruction, I heard Dr. Gosen kind of answer the question that Shayla just had on page um, the page before. But also, if you look down below, I noticed the same amount of money has increased it again on the computer instruction right in this area, and then it went down again. So can you explain why? Yeah, that that actually is a very clear cut example of what Mr. Herbst was saying, which is just we had federal funding, we spent it um, on. It, classroom, so interactive panels, um, a, a document cameras, some of the things that Ms. Williams was talking about earlier. So we were spending the money that we had, not knowing if we were gonna have that money for the future. That was almost like a one-time investment uh, is why it's positioned that way. So that's why you see the up and down nature of it. Um, you're re referring to the 206,000, I think, right? Um, well, actually it's uh, on page 2019, no, 2014, I believe it is, on 2014, no, it's not. Today. Yeah. 
but you win that earlier because you have two different charges when that yep. the bottom it comes. But so so I'm I'm kind of a little puzzled because if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, you guys, what you're saying is some of this money is going to come from the grant and the CARES Act money, but we still have it in the budget. So that's what goes to my question is, and to you, Michael, would some way in this budget book it show where that money was separated and where money was already part of our budget and what money has came from the CARES Act or grant money? Actually, uh, we yes. don't. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, but I'm sorry. saying, go ahead, Michael, and I'll come uh, after you. In uh, each section, we do, uh, do separate unrestricted, which is really the general fund expenditures, and then the restricted is all the grant expenditures. So um, what you're seeing in the restricted section is primarily uh, the CARES Act for last year, uh, as well as some other smaller grants. Okay, thank you. And that's that. also why you see a decrease, because we have taken it into account and no longer need operating funds for it because we're using the grant money. Okay, thank you. So when I go through it, I'll understand that little part a little better. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Valentine. Thank you, and thank you for, uh, thank you, uh, the Golson, your staff, for joining us uh, tonight. Um, my question uh, is more about incomes as opposed to outputs, outcomes, excuse me, as relates to the budget. As a board, every year, you know, uh, we're working on a fixed, on a, on a set amount of money. And as board members, we go back and forth about how we think that money should be spent. But as we know, that's pretty much a function of the budget amount. And so my question is in line with, I imagine a lot of our constituents are thinking about is one, we hear that um, incoming President Biden has uh, proposed a, a massive amount of money uh, to reopen schools the same time, uh, a gov Governor Maryland has pledged similar amount the state legislature. And also we have local partners that have supported our system in the past, particularly MGM uh, with casino funds. And so my question is, uh, how do we, how much money do you envision getting from any future um, funding from the, at the federal and state level? And if so, how will that money be spent or change this budget? And secondly, how has the economy, particularly in Prince George's County, and the, I, I imagine, reduced revenues from MGM um, going to impact uh, this budget? Mr. Valentine, it sounds like your question would go under business management services as opposed to um, information technology. So can we close out information technology? Oh, no, I mean, I mean, my, my question is, is, is relating to particularly uh, in the event that there's money coming from the federal government, I imagine some of that money is going to go to information technology uh, and complement some of the, the budget items uh, that we're talking about now. And so to Dr. Zuckerman and others, in the event we do get additional funding from the federal government, how will that money be spent? How will it impact this budget uh, in any way? Or are there other areas that you believe supplemental funding from the federal and state government will be used? And if so, how, but also the, the point of particularly around income um, from uh, local funding to impact this budget? My response won't focus just on technology. And so I agree it's under the business and management services piece, but I'll go ahead and state it just so we can close this portion out. My first priority is gonna be around, honestly, truly our student, about student instruction. And uh, it cost us about, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Herbertson, about 8 million a day. So to employ all of our staff to have a full additional school day. So as we're adding extra days, we'd have to find money to do that. So as people are talking about an extended school year, it'd be ideal to begin to repurpose some of our own operating money around that. that not, that's not a focus on technology, that's just around vision and around how we will function as a school system, which will fall under business management. Thank you, Dr. Golson. Um, Ms. Shepard. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sackerman, I, I, I'm pretty sure you already thought about this, of uh, the possibility of having the hybrid model. Uh, my question is, if we do have the hybrid model pretty soon or at the beginning of next year, we, um, how much are we gonna pay? Are we gonna still continuing to pay the same amount that we pay on the platforms that we're utilizing right now? or would that be less amount of, that we would be paying? It, it would be the same amount. Yeah, there's the licenses. We have licenses for, for our students and for our teachers, so that wouldn't change. 
And remember hybrid means that just 50% of students are in the building, the other 50% are still working online. So there will be students working online every day at some point, whether they're in person or not. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I understand that because that is another huge expense that our school system is going to have when we will have to be in person, our electricity bills, our water, everything is going to go up. And in addition to that, we will have to pay the same uh, amount of money that we are paying right now for our platforms, which are not quite cheap, if I might, if I am understanding correctly. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. So are there any more specific questions for Dr. Zuckerman on information technology? If not, then no, we can move. No, Dr. Miller, I do apologize. No question, but the comment, um, and I do appreciate my colleagues, Ms. Shepard, um, for her saying, and that is so true, everything is gonna go up, but I just want us to remember as board members, the same way things are going up for our school systems, they're going up in our households. I know my gas, my electric, my water, my food, my internet service, I had to double internet services just to make sure I get a connection. So it's going up in people's households too. So the salaries and everything that our staff and everybody's getting is so important. So let's all continue to remember that. Thank you. With that, we'll move to business management services. Any questions? I guess, Mr. Valentine, this will be an opportune time to elaborate on your concerns or questions. Well, I mean, I guess I just reiterate, I think again, every, every, every budget year, uh, it, it comes down to um, a fixed amount of money that is a function of the money we get from the state, uh, federal and local governments. Um, and there's always a conversation around where's the money coming from MGM? Uh, how come Pritchard is County is not getting their fair share from the state? What are we doing with the federal money? And so I guess, this, again, my question is, um, assuming that we do get additional money from the Biden administration uh, and uh, the governor's office, how will we ensure that that money is going to the highest priority issue that you just mentioned, Dr. Golson? Um, but also, uh, this is, you know, a conversation I have every year as well. How can we as a board member be advocating at the state, um, particularly at the state and local level, to ensure that uh, our school system remains a priority? Otherwise, as board members, we are going to have to uh, fight over a shrinking pie. Um, and that's, it's just, we do it every year. And board members have priorities. We are a large board, as we know, and uh, everyone has their own priority, but the pie does not grow and in many years it shrinks. And right now, obviously, we have fixed costs that we cannot cut, uh, but there are also costs that may get cut that may impact student achievement. And so just in generally, how can we ensure that we have uh, the funding um, to address the issues you talk about? And if so, where that money going to go? May I ask a question? Um... In reference to that, uh, we talk about uh, spending and costs going up. I was looking at the budget uh, expenditures for the last 2018-19 uh, and the projection for 20, yeah, this school year, of funds that the school board is sending back to the general fund. I need some clarification on what happens to that those funds uh, that go back to the general fund and why can't they be reallocated somewhere where we're having a shortfall? Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, those funds generally are uh, reallocated and we do that through a couple of processes. One is uh, throughout the year, we um, come to the uh, board with recommendations that we call financial reviews. And uh, at that time, we um, asked the board to approve money um, that isn't gonna be spent in one area to move it to other areas uh, based on state categories. Uh, and then additionally, at the end of the year, any money that's within the general fund that is unspent goes into our uh, fund balance accounts. And uh, we do each year um, request as part of uh, the uh, budget appropriation that, uh, or the budget that the Board of Education passes to use a portion of those uh, fund balances or essentially a savings account to close the operating budget gap. And this year uh, we did significantly increase the amount that we're requesting to use by about uh, $44 million. Um, so 
it, in general, we do it in those two ways. During the year, we reallocate, and then at the end of the year, anything that's underspent, uh, and that really gets in the conversation we are having earlier about some areas that will get underspent, and some of those are strategic for this year, uh, and we're doing that through thing, uh, through strategies like uh, hiring and overtime freezes. We know that we will be able to underspend portions of the budget, and then uh, we will be able to redirect that to close the gap for next year. Dr. Golson, um, do you mind if I had to say something on Curtis's question about the... And, the, and then I'm after you. Uh, so just to, I'll speak to the federal side, it, and a little bit to the state side. Obviously in both situations, the president and the governor have proposed something, um, but there is a legislative body that tends to almost always have their say, their imprint on what that is. But most importantly, as it relates to COVID, um, we knew that a lot of times it's grant funding or there's strings attached to the resource. So while it may be you know, more money for us, Michael's team along with Doug's team and Dr. Golson have to make sure that the money is spent the way it's appropriated. And it's not always a just a, a blank check, so to speak. Um, I'll let Dr. Golson speaks to more about the other pieces, but the this important with the legislative piece. Yeah, we may get more money, but it may not fix our problems as it relates to revenue because it, it might be targeted into one location and not the whole school district. And I just wanted to give input around the state recommendation. If you recall earlier this year, what we did talk about is making sure we stay informed and contacting our own elected officials around the per pupil expenditure amount. So if we recall, all of our school districts in the state of Maryland had a decrease in enrollment. And because of that, we anticipated having a decrease in our funds that we get. So it is important that all of us continue to converse with our elected officials to see that they provide us funding per pupil expenditure based on last year's enrollment numbers and not current year, or we are slated to lose a substantial amount of funding. And so while I believe um, the governor might have that in his proposed budget, just because it's there does not mean it's guaranteed. We have to follow that um, request all the way until signing up. Dr. Golson, this one follow up question to your, to your point. How does how is the maintenance of effort impact that? This is you know news to me. Oh, dramatic, because then that means that as for those people who know, maintenance of effort means it's just the amount that they're required to give us based on what our per people will per, percentage amount is. So we'll get less than what we got. Hence is why we started the process of beginning the hiring freeze. If you recall, we had this conversation in October because we knew that literally we were coming to the cliff in terms of decreasing enrollment. We are hopeful. I mean, that means that everyone has to continue to speak to the elected officials around making sure that we get funding per pupil based on enrollment from last school year and not this one because we are 2000 students short than where we were before. And it's not just Prince George's, it's every district in the state of Maryland. And, and Curtis, this is a note, I think in, our, in the presentation that Golson did in December, there's a slide that speaks to key assumptions. I recommend that we pull that slide back up. That key, there's some key assumptions that uh, we put in there, which was that the state hold is harmless and that the county fund us at least to what they funded us last year, regardless of maintenance of effort, because they actually, based off of Dr. Golson's numbers that she just mentioned, they actually would be obligated to give us much less. So there are some key assumptions that we're making, but it requires legislative action and some let, and some advocacy. And Ms. Booza Strother, I'll say this for you, Kerwin, 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 because much of what we're talking about here is really related to the passage of a pretty large piece that we've been fighting for as a jurisdiction for the last several years. If Kerwin doesn't pass, the governor's proposed budget really doesn't help us fix the problem we're in. And frankly, it won't help the county be able to fund us where they need to be. Thank you. Uh, Sonia Williams, Ms. Williams, you had a question. Thank you. I think um, Dr. Golson probably answered my question. I had a lengthy conversation with a couple of our legislators about around the budget from the state. And I was surprised by their comment because they said, well, we are not expecting that much of a decrease on income because of what they were doing, what they've done in the past to be able to tax online sales, what they've been able to do with, um, you know, grocery stores and our uh, real estate property tax and the income from real estate tra uh, transactions has not really decreased. 
And so I found that to be really interesting. But with your saying, with what you're saying, and based on what we've seen in the past, we've seen an increase over the last few years of about 2,000 students. And this year, being that we did not increase to 2,000 and we did decrease by, by 2,000, the gap is actually 4,000. And so that is a, a big number that I think that, that we're, we're looking at as far as um, pupil income. And I could see now how we sort of, how we really solidified or um, uh, calculated that, that big difference of $110 million that we're not gonna see. And so um, I think you, you answered my question about how did we come up with that, that budget gap based on what I was hearing from the legislature. And also, I just wanted to thank you for answering all of my questions in the, um, in, in the budget round. I know I had a lot of questions and I think that these types of conversations is good for us as a board to, this is our point to monitor the budget. The budgets that we approved in 2020, FY20, have come to pass this past June. And so all of those sort of uh, goals that we set that showed up two years ago, we're finally able to determine whether or not we have met those goals. And I saw in quite a few of my answers that we have met the goals or exceeded the goals. But I think that um, with that said, you know, maybe our goal should be stretch a little to give us a little stretch, you know, let's reach a little, little higher um, so that we can continue to move the system in the right direction. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Stafford, unmute. Thank you. So I had uh, some specific questions around um, I know we're on right now we're on business management services is just in the budget is that on page 167 those are budget and management services or yes uh so business that, management services uh includes several departments one of okay. those is uh budget uh, and management okay. services okay so um i submitted this question to staff but maybe you could just provide some some background for me just on our process for hiring admin professionals. Um, so I've noticed across several departments that we're talking about this evening, um, IT, um, budget and management, HR, uh, um, in departments we're not speaking about this evening like strategic planning or employee labor. Uh, there seems to be an increase every year and also in this year going into 2020, the 2022 budget, uh, particularly in the salaries and wages uh, and employee benefits for uh, admin professionals, specialists, and secretaries. And so I just wanted to know about sort of what are some of the policies around adding more admin professionals annually? Like what, what is happening that we're increasing that, you know, it seems to be across several departments every year. So that's really my question. Uh, so I, I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, are you referring to the uh, dollar amounts or the uh, FTE, like the number of stuff? I'm, I'm assuming it's the FTE as well, because it's also, I'm also seeing an increase in the employee benefits. So I'm assuming that more employees are being added to the existing admin professionals in several departments every year. So so uh, in, in most of the cases, uh, both the, uh, the dollar amounts that you're seeing are going up because of the um, salary increases in our negotiated contracts uh, on an annual basis. And uh, the benefits amounts are also increasing just uh, in terms of um, what we're seeing with national trends. We are um, uh, increasing both the employer and employee contribution to benefits um, uh, and they actually show up with the individual employees. So in most of these cases, it's not actually an increase new FTE. It's just that the salaries are going up um, with the negotiated contracts and the benefits as well. Uh, the cost per employee is going up. Ms. Queen. Thank you again, Dr. Miller. I um, just want to um, thank Dr. Gosen and Dr. Um, Mr. Rose. Um, also for bringing up about the December um, 
event where Dr. Gosen did go over that. I think it's something that's very important, you guys, that we not only need to be marketing, but get it out to not only just us as board members, but to our constituents, to our staff, to realize that it takes each and every one of us to get out there and to reach our elected officials and let them know that it's going to affect all of us. It's going to affect us as a state. One of the things that Dr. Gosen kept saying over and over again, and if, I know you heard it because I heard it, it's not just Prince George's County, it's throughout the whole state. So that means it's each and every one of us, it's gonna affect each and every one of our household. So that means each and every one of us, everybody who's listening, everybody has their family member, as Senator Benson always say, tell Lottie Dottie and everybody, you guys, we gotta let everybody know that we need to reach out to our elected leaders and say, hey, we need you to actually, you know, to put it back to what it was back, even if it's 2019 or whatever, because we know we didn't meet it this year. We know that we didn't get the students this year, and it's so important um, because they know it. It's the same way we, our households had to freeze at our homes because of COVID 2019, then they need to freeze everything else. Um, so we need to request that, and I think it's going to take each of us to, you know, to reach out to our legislators and let them know that. So I just wanted to actually just say that again is how important it is and how important as a board that we remember to constantly market that and bring it back up and make sure that we're letting everybody know that we need your help only together we can make a difference which means it's going to take each and every one of us to make this difference for prince george's county public schools thank you are there any other questions comments then we can move to re human resources questions in reference to human resources. Hi, Dr. Murphy. Hi, Dr. Miller. Hi to everybody too. Uh, Ms. Queen. Yeah. Okay, I have a question that I got out and I don't think you got it yet late. I mean, you got it late. So um, Dr. Murphy on page 199, human resource operating and staff, I noticed it was an increase for FY21 approved compared to the estimate for workman compensation, and then it decreased in the cost decreased it in FY22. Um, I just have a problem when things increase and then they go back down, you know, because if it's an increase, it should be maybe leveled out a little bit. Can you explain to me why the in big increase over the S um, what was approved, but then it goes back down in 22? Sure. Um, I'm actually going to defer to Chief Herbstman on that because the work compensation aligns also with the way things go up and down for employee benefits. So Chief Herbstman. Yes. Uh, so this is based on the way that we budget for um, employees, uh, for workers comp uh, across the division. It actually is linked to individual employees uh, and it's based on their average cost, not specific costs to those employees. So it's very similar how do we treat other benefits and we do an estimate each year of what we need in total to um uh to uh per employee to get to the totals that we need to budget across the board for uh workers compensation okay. um so this line uh, i can't speak to the specifics of this line that we could that does look like a more substantial increase than i'd see on other ones mm -hmm. uh but we could answer that specific line in writing uh but this isn't really a set aside mount for uh workman's compensation it just happens to be linked to those specific employees okay i was just uh, curious because i noticed in fy20 it was low but then we estimated in fy21 that it would be an increase, which we knew that, but then it goes back again low in FY 2022. And I was just curious why, maybe because we have less workmen comp because everybody out and they have to sue their own stuff being at home, I don't know. But I was just curious why. But I, then I have another question is, um, what is the reason for the new cost of other contractor service proposed um, on that page also on FY 22? And that's on the same page. Sure, so we actually propose to realign funds from a different costing string. So if you go back to FY21, under professional contract services, there was an amount for about $816,000. We actually separated that amount and put it in the appropriate costing string. And that money is for um, our fingerprinting, uh, our participation with the Amity program for our foreign exchange educators. Um, there are a couple of contracts that are different from the professional contracts. Okay, so what you're saying is because what I'm looking at is nothing on the FY20, FY21 at all, but then we have it in FY22, so you moved it from somewhere else on here? 
Yes, we moved it from, if, uh, if you go probably one, two, three lines down, you'll see professional contract services. Okay. And you see $816,000, but then for pro proposed for FY22, it's only 250 because we took some contracts ended, but then some we just separated out so that it's in the appropriate costing stream for um, budget purposes. Okay, so um, I'm glad you mentioned that some contract entered. I think that was one of the questions that I sent later on today because I'm really curious and I'll get that information about what contracts do we still have out here? Um, what contracts actually will be aspiring? What's the terms of some of the contracts? So that was one of the questions that I was concerned about also. And that's any type of contracts that we have at the, um, um, at the school system. So thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, my questions, I had three of the six questions under HR, so I appreciate you answering them, but I want to take this opportunity to um, thank Dr. Murphy on settling our HR department. I've been a part of this board for six years, I believe now, and the first three or four years, there was a lot of moving parts and changes in, in the HR department, and I think that um, with with your stability, we're able to begin to reach our goal of making our staff reflect our population. And so um, in looking at some of the, the cost expenditures and some of my questions, they may not have fallen under your uh, reign of HR, but um, I appreciate the answers to all the questions that I asked. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Valentine. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Murphy, for all the work that you do. Um, my first question is kind of similar to my colleague, Mr. Burroughs' first question, which is um, around cost savings under COVID. Can you talk in general how the cost of recruitment of uh, professionals has changed and whether there is any savings, uh, similarly, professional development through using um, you know, virtual learning rather than renting spaces. I know we use our own spaces sometimes, but we also do uh, other costs associated with professional development and sort of what that looks like uh, and how those savings are being used. The second question is around the nature of recruitment in a virtual space um, and not so much to cost savings, but how are we using the money that we do have to ensure that we're uh, ensuring that we have the best pool of applicants as possible. Uh, is there a benefit of this virtual environment that allows us to, to sort of fish in a bigger pool of, of, uh, of applicants um, as well? Uh, thirdly, you know, obviously uh, my passion for diversity and teaching, particularly as it relates to male educators of color, how is, how is, how is your office using the resources we have now uh, to ensure that we maintain that as a priority um, as well. And what resources do you need? If not, so I'll just say, you know, data show that we have the highest percentage of male educators in the region and the highest percentage of male, educated, uh, male educators of color in the region. I just want to keep on that path. Uh, I understand there was some program that you were working on, particularly around uh, Latino male educators, which is, which is a thing that should be a priority as well. Just want to make sure you have the resources that you need uh, to one, ensure that we have that diversity, that our, our teaching core reflects our demographics with, with around race and, and ethnicity, but also how does this COVID virtual environment impact our ability to really identify strong candidates and if there are any savings that we have through this uh, sort of virtual recruitment world. Again, thank you so much for all the work you do. Well, thank you. I felt like that was an interview question with four different parts. So I'm going to do my best to make sure that I hit on all of them. Um, you know, I also want to go back and, and thank um, Vice Chair Williams for her um, comment. Um, and one of the things that we really tried to do under Dr. Golson's leadership is to be more strategic in our staffing. And I believe that Dr. Golson did share with you our FY21 into 22 staffing plan. Um, it is a pretty robust document with lots of different data points over the last three, five years. Um, I also like to hi highlight that there is a page that we uh, did identify for each of your districts where you can see a video and kind of use that as our brand ambassador. So, 
when we talk about the cost savings that you mentioned, I can only uh, speak for the human capital. And so because in the midst of our hiring season, which you know starts in March, that was the same time that COVID really hit um, its peak and a lot of things shut down. So our recruitment was impacted in regards to the trips that we would traditionally take. Um, Mr. Thomas was supposed to join us in Puerto Rico to help us recruit, but as he can say, that trip had to be canceled. But it also gave us an opportunity to engage in that distance learning. So we were able to keep uh, immediately make the switch to a virtual environment. And I thank Mr. Burroughs for coming to some of our virtual fairs and bringing greetings and talking to our candidates. Um, it did allow for us to really engage in a larger audience. Um, and audiences that we probably would have never um, thought about. We have educators who were interested in joining us that live in California. Um, there were just so many different opportunities that we had um, for them to come to join us. So the cost savings, I think that we really saved a lot on our recruitment trips and going out and making everything virtual. However, it was also, um, a challenge because of COVID that many people were not, they felt unsettled and not willing to up and relocate to the area. So when you speak about asking about um, what resources do we need, I've said this before and I know I've shared it with uh, board member Ahmed and Mr. Burroughs and would definitely love to partner. Um, what we need more than anything, I think, is affordable housing. Um, you know, when you talk about the cost of living and, you know, uh, if you remember from our compensation study, our salaries are within the market range, but our cost of living um, can be a challenge. So San Francisco a few years ago actually built their own housing unit for their educators. And I would love to be able to use that as a recruitment strategy. I will continue to say that, you know, we are um, one of the largest um, school systems in the country surrounded by two other large school systems. And so recruitment can be a challenge when you want to bring people here and having to compete with those other um, localities and making sure that we can offer something that they cannot get any place else. In regards to um, the diversity and maintaining that as a priority. Yes, last year we did pilot our Latinx leadership program because while we have a phenomenal match of our African-American students, we, we still struggle with our Latinx students. Um, I think it's 34% of our students, but yet we only have about 6% that would include educators and administrators. So that's an area that we're still trying to focus on. As you can see from our expected outcomes, we have pretty high goals for ourselves, but we weren't able to meet those. So we'll continue to work towards those, but I am opening to partnering with you all for additional thoughts on how to increase um, that particular population. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Our time is up for uh, this section. Mr. Burroughs, maybe you can tie your question into the last section on accountability. Sure. Okay, uh, we're starting the timer now. You have five minutes. Uh, Doctor, thank you, Dr. Miller. And good to see you, Dr. Murphy, as always. Uh, my question is around accountability as it relates to uh, the conditional teacher certification program that we worked on. Sure. You know, what the uh, status is of that, how that's going, and what the board might need to do to continue to support that important initiative. Sure. So just to make sure everyone knows, and you know, we're always grateful for your support. We brought before the Obafo committee the challenge that we have um, right now. We have about fourteen hundred conditional educators, and we have found in working with them a big challenge they have is is not only time management but also paying for their classes because many of them still have courses and they need to pass the practices so between having a full day of scheduling and then going to class at night um, and with the support of Dr. Golson and the support of Prince George's County Community College and then the funding for the board we were able to create our conditional educator program so it probably would be best if I followed up in writing so you can actually see the numbers and see how we're doing um, we've been specifically monitoring that because we know that we will be coming back sharing that information with you. Um, but our, we're continuing to move along. We're offering those classes. Many we're actually able to offer ourselves through PGC um, PS and it's only the methods class that we have to go to Prince George's Community College. So we're proud of that work and we'll, we'll share with you in writing where we are with that as an update. Thank you. 
we've moved into accountability. Are there any questions? Any comments from you, Dr. Strader? Dr. Go, uh, Dr. Miller, I, I have a question about- oh, Okay, you. your hand just went up. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you, Dr. Strader, for all you do and all the, the conversations we've had, because you know data is one of the things that I try to look at, look at and monitor. Um, and, and thank you for answering all of my questions under this, under this section. I think I had all but one of the questions under this section that was presented in our Q&A session. The uh, first question, thank you for, for also um, putting in writing that we've moved from the MSDE bridge to excellent model to the ESSA model. Um, making that connection is, is good for me to understand what is replacing what. Um, and as I just mentioned earlier about reaching and exceeding our goals, I think it's important that we reach our goals and that gives us an opportunity to see what we're doing right. But it also gives us an opportunity to say, is that, is that goal a softball or is it something that we had to work towards? And I'm gonna say that we worked towards it because you exceeded it by $4 million, the goals that were set in FY2020, um, yeah. And so my question is, um, where can we, where can we find, how can we use this to develop, how do we use this, uh, what is it, the SM plan in our strategic plan, meaning the plan that we submitted to, to the state of Maryland for approval, how is that then incorporated into our strategic plan? How, is there a direct connection or is that something that is a, a different sort of uh, uh, process or, or a thing that we, we are looking at? Well, thank you for the question. So the plan that we submit to the state is called the, the acronym is the LEX plan. That's the Local ESSA Consolidated Strategic Plan. Mm -hmm. Placing a bridge to excellence. And again, that's an annual submission. One of the biggest differences uh, between the LEX plan and the prior Bridge to Excellence plan is the incorporation of all the title applications within that plan. Title I, Title II, Title III, IV. Um, so again, it, now it is one consolidated plan, which helps uh, because it helps you to focus all of your resources to the um, targets that you identify within that plan. So uh, our efforts now are also to uh, focus on our new strategic plan, replacing the one we've had in place for the last five years. Uh, so moving forward, uh, we're developing that plan now. Um, so it's the same office and the same hands on deck uh, developing both of these plans um, at the same time. And there's a lot of analysis and lessons learned that, that we incorporate through uh, developing the LEX plan uh, that we are baking into the effort of developing our own strategic plan. Uh, so Veronica Harrison and the Strategic uh, uh, Planning Resource Management Office there is responsible for coordinating the efforts in developing both plans. Um, in conjunction with the strategic plan is also going to be incorporating uh, the equity office. Uh, Dr. David Reese is involved in that effort to make sure that we also have an equity lens uh, through that process. So the authors of both, or I should say the coordinators of both are the same. And again, we're using a lot of the same data that goes into both to inform the decisions of both. So both plans are being uh, authored at the same time, pulled together at the same time. So you will see a continuity of the plans. Now the timing of the publishing of, the, of each of the plans may cause us to have to do some reconciliation uh, because the LEX plans do just before we finish our strategic plan. So we may need to add an additional step of some reconciliation of our goals and so forth as we get through this. But again, I think you're gonna see a lot of overlap between these two because of the data that's involved with developing both of these. Thank you very much. And just as uh, uh, it's not really a lot around budget, but your process of going from you know, data reports and plans that you develop and moving into the SMART goals that the schools sort of, uh, the schools develop internally. Can you just give us a quick sort of overview of, of strategic plan, these 
uh, state plans that ends up, ends up as a SMART plan or a SMART goal for the schools. What is the flow of development and how, how does it look? And also at what point or how it, when will the public, including the board, have an opportunity to see the final outcome? Okay, taking some notes. So building upon your last question, looking at the Lex plan versus the strategic plan, I think uh, we'll hit upon your question that you're asking here, the first part of it. That Lex plan, so that local SEDATA consolidated strategic plan supports the actual academic excellence imperative for the state. So that is built using the template from the state with a primary, very focused effort on looking at academic excellence, academic achievement, and the data and so forth that supports that is for those specific targets that we have in mind. Now, as we analyze that data, and again, each of the departments are part of that process. The Strategic Planning Resource Management Office pulls in the Curriculum Instruction Office, the area offices, and so forth, as we work through this data to get their input. And so that way they can go through the analysis on their own part to, and reflect on their involvement in these. And that reflection actually spills into the development of their goals. Now those goals, um, we have a timeline and a process that we've laid out for each of the divisions to create their goals. And we can share that timeline with you. Um, but that part of that process requires the reflection within each of the departments to roll up to the chief level. The chief then works and, and collaborates among their departments uh, to make sure that they're all um, speaking of the same voice, would you say, and looking at their goals collectively. Those goals are then reviewed by the strategic planning office and make sure the formatting and the flavor and, and continuity of those goals is all intact, as well as it's reviewed through our equity office to make sure that equity lens is also apparent in each of these. Then those goals are collected. We uh, evaluate those as a cabinet level uh, before we move those goals on to Dr. Goldson. And Dr. Goldson gives her final approval of the goals, then they go into the budget book. So that's the process. That's how we use our data start at the bottom and it works its way up to get through all of the leadership teams before sign off and present it to you all. I've been my final question is- yeah, and Mike Herbson can share with you the date and I believe you're gonna have that in March. Mm -hmm. CFO can share that with you. Uh, yes, it'll be uh, February 25th when we publish the uh, board, re or the, yes, the board of education's requested budget. It'll include the new um, um, expected outcomes. Okay. okay, great. And yep. so that is when we will have an opportunity to have input on the strategic plan or just the budget? That'll be the budget at that time. The strategic planning process is a separate process from the establishment of our budget the way it's laid out now to meet the timelines of the budget delivery. The strategic planning piece, I can share that timeline with you as well so you can see how all these individual pieces, the LEX, the budget, the strategic plan, how they all intersect. We can make that available to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Queen. Thank you, Dr. Miller. I just want a clarification. What section of questions are we on? Accountability. Just any accountability or chief accountability office? I'm trying to figure out where, because I have my questions in 141 under accountability. Is it a certain section? So are you asking me or Dr. Schrader? It starts on page 141 in your budget book. Um, for I just want to make sure, thank you, Dr. Goldson, before I ask mm -hmm. the question. So I do have questions. Um, it, it actually starts on page 149. Under catering, and I don't know who would actually answer this, I noticed it was a huge increase in catering um, um, during this pandemic, and I'm just wondering why. So, looking at page 149, and actually, I believe several of the questions that you submitted um, all have a similar um, explanation as to what's going on with this. And the chief financial officer can assist me in this. What you're seeing here is looking at the Title I uh, federal funds. Uh, when we go into our annual year, each of these values are actually estimated based on central office costs. These aren't actual budgeted uh, to this date. And Mr. Herbson may want to chime in here as far as what their processes are. Obviously, there's not going to be an increase of catering for this upcoming year, especially with the COVID piece. 
but this is a formulaic approach to place these numbers in until we actually know what those actual title funds are going to be and we receive them. Did I do an adequate job there? Yes, I think that's correct. Uh, this really has a lot to do with the timing of federal funds and that we're making estimates that uh, aren't exactly in alignment with our budget year. So uh, until we know more about exactly how those funds will be budgeted, they're, they're done off of formulas from the prior year and then uh, adjusted later in the process. Okay, so help me understand it. So what you're saying is when, um, as I noticed that when we budgeted um, in 20, 10,000, and then we approved 8,500 for 2021, but you are estimated to be 32,500 um, for catering. Um, I don't know who's catering and eating during COVID, but is, isn't that not an overestimate? I think it, it very likely is an overestimate. I think there's uh, uh, likely going to be uh, very little catering across the school division this year, uh, across the school district this year. Okay. And I just want to make a note that even earlier this year in October, if you recall, I issued a memo to all staff noting that we also made a 10% reduction in all of our current budgets. We not only asked schools to do it, but we did as well. And this is one of those areas where we knew we could find a savings that we pulled back. Okay, okay. Because I, I understand the statement, but it looked like it's estimated at a little higher. So that's that was really concerning to me um, during the COVID season that catering was estimated at a, a higher cost. Um, another, if we go down on the same page, um, here we go with the software again I, and, and software license. I understand it's a little higher because we're going through the software, of, you know, online services and everybody needing licenses more than ever. But I'm still not understanding why we have that big, huge increase. And I mean, huge, it's huge for 2021, which wasn't approved, but now it's estimated over. But we have nothing for 2022. That, that's bothersome to me because I don't want us to go into 2022 and then I'm gonna have the same question. I'll be like, wait a minute, we didn't have anything and why we have this big increase. So I'm wondering why we have nothing on here for 2022. So again, this has to do with the overestimation of using a formula to complete the budget uh, for this past year. The actual fiscal uh, year 21 software amount was 64,000. So to project the 560,000 on this um, doesn't make you know, again, it's, it's a similar argument of, of how these uh, estimates are, are being generated here for the purpose of completing this book until we actually get the uh, federal funds so we know ex exactly what they are. Mike, is it fair to say that this is functioning like a placeholder until we are able to reconcile the, fine, the, the request with the final? I mean, we have to put the money somewhere in the state mandated categories. Okay. Is that the right answer, Mike? Yes, that's correct. This is yes. primarily, this is title funds we're looking at here. And it's uh, a way that we're estimating uh, where we're going to be is, uh, does make this appear pretty confusing, but we could get uh, additional details on those couple of lines on exactly how we got to those estimates. So in all reality, you guys, I won't actually see the actual until next year budget. Uh, that's correct. That's correct. So this, I think this is what's throwing me off because I see the actual for 20, but let, let me just go to the last one that would, because some of the other ones may be just a little minor, but these large charges <laughs> really get to me. And I guess if they are going to be the same because they're all estimated because you have that big mm -hmm. large charge for the commuter, computer instruction. So all of these charges where I see these big large charges, so I can understand that what you guys saying, you just overestimated just for now. But when I see the actual it'll come out, it may come out a little different. I just wanted clarification of that. Yeah, I would say, and, and the way you can look at that is when you're looking at the restricted funds, those restricted funds are the federal title funds. Mm -hmm. In that category, that gives you an idea that those restricted funds are purely estimated until we actually get what those values are gonna be. Okay, okay thank you so very much. I think that will, help me with some of it. So I have one last question. And three minutes, Ms. Queen. Okay, no problem. I can think I can do this in three minutes. So um, since this is on the um, accountability, um, um, I'm just wondering how are we being, because as I read the mission under this, how are we being accountable for the kids who are about to graduate or the students who are in the 11th grade? Because I've never been in school and because of now, because of COVID, they're getting no on-job training. It seemed to be no summer jobs. A lot of them didn't get too many summer jobs. Not like you worked at Six Flags or found something at McDonald's. 
So how are we being a little bit, I mean, even a lot of our CT and training classes are on hold. So how as a school system, we're putting in this accountability to look into place to help our students who would normally do that work study, who would normally get some extra on-job training. Where is that in our budget? Is there any type of accountability, even within our school system as a whole, that maybe we have some little jobs that they can do online to do some clerical work or some other work? Where is that accountability at in our budget? So let me respond. They're actually, first, we still partner with our county government under the Summer Youth Employment Program. And this past summer, there were students who did, um, who were employed in that program. Students had the option, not many of them took it because we were still in COVID and they did not, they had like limited hours, but they could still do it. So um, I do know um, SYEP recently sent out another information update for students to sign up. The window will be coming up very soon. It typically is in March. Um, and they do have a program right now that they're recommending that people sign up for. So students, we will push that information out from the county government when that does come. Yeah. In terms of internships, as it relates to career and technical education, um, for our students in that area, because of COVID, once again, many of them had to do online experiences and not in-person experiences, just very similar to the technical skills assessments that were not be able to be administered those on-hand experiences, but they could still do the written assessment portion piece to them receiving their technical certification. So we are hoping that by this summer, we'll be able to change more in-person experiences as the vaccine rolls out and we get very close to herd immunity. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Are there any more questions relative to accountability? <clears throat> If not, then thank you for participating in our first work session for the proposed fiscal year 2022 operating budget. Uh, I'm hoping that everyone may be able to join the board for the budget public hearing, which is scheduled to begin at 7 p.m. And uh, for those of you who plan to participate, uh, you can get the, um, the um, access number on our web, web page. Uh, also, please join us for our next budget work session and public hearing on February the 2nd, 2021. And the budget work session will begin at 5 p.m. and the hearing will begin at 7. So please check our website for more information regarding how to sign up to provide testimony for the hearing. And you do need to sign up in order to observe either meeting. Dr. Now Miller. may I have a motion and a second to adjourn this evening's bu budget work session. Dr. Miller, quick question. Yes. Uh, Ms. King, are you gonna send us a separate link for the, um, the public session or how's that go? Yes, so the, um, the session at 7 p.m. is going to be a teletown hall and that is listed in the calendar invite on your Google calendar. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, motion, motion to adjourn. Second. It has been moved and second that we adjourn. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. This concludes the January 19th, 2021 budget work session. Thank you and be safe. And I'll see you all in 15 minutes. <laughs> or I'll hear from you in 10, 15 minutes. So let me get out of this.